In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the pole zero map on the z-plane. So if you look at the contents, I'm going to detail the mapping between the s-plane and the z-plane. I'll then go on to poles and zeros on the z-plane, system properties and response. And then I've got an example, so I've got the water tank. So after this um, lecture, you should be able to understand the following. So the mapping between the s and the z-plane. The mapping of poles on the z-plane and the effect of the location of these and the, the effect that the location of the poles has on the system response. And understand how the proportional control gain, when we've got the closed loop um, control system, affects the, co the closed loop um, transfer function coefficients and hence the location of the poles on the z-plane. So if you recall when you went through continuous time um, systems modeling and control and you had something known as the s-plane. So this here is the S-plane, and this consists of effectively two halves. You can see here this is the left half plane, and you'd also have the right half plane, which isn't, which isn't shown here, but you would have the right half plane. The left half plane is where you want to locate your poles for a stable system. Um, for an unstable system, you'd locate them in the right half plane, so hence over here. If the system was unstable, the poles would be located here. Along the imaginary axis here, be a marginally stable system so you know a system that just oscillates so this is effectively undamped it's got no damping and a system response obviously in the left half plane you get a nice kind of system response that looks something like that whether it's critically damped over damped or under damped and then the right half plane unstable response so the response will effectively just grow so what's the um the left half of the s plane consists of it consists of lines of damping ratio so you can see these lines here going away from the origin of the s plane so here oh, it's not very really straight but you get the idea 0 0.1 0 0.2 0 0.34 0 0.46 so these are lines of damping ratios so these are values of zeta so zeta 1 there and zeta 2 where you can obviously see as you move around um zeta's obviously increasing then what we have here is you can see here lines going around here. These are your lines of natural frequency. So lines of natural frequency denoted omega. In this case, omega 1 and omega 2, where omega 2 is obviously greater than omega 1. So that there is our um, S plane. So lines of natural frequency, lines of damping. When we work out the poles of a closed loop trans function, we map the poles onto here. So we've got a pair of complex conjugate poles here. And these poles here have certain properties. They have a natural frequency and they also have a damping ratio. And this here is explained via this equation here, where you're in the general form for the second order. Where you can see here we've got our damping ratio, so zeta here, and our natural frequency. A natural frequency there. So as you've seen before, what we can do is we can take the general equation here and we can look at a transfer function here and we can work out the properties. So obviously because omega squared is equal to 4, if we take the square root of 4, that's then going to give us our natural frequency. We can then take this part of the equation here, and because we know natural frequency, we can rearrange this to make z to the subject. So you can see here, z to the subject. So in this case, it's 2.4, because overall 2 omega multiplied by zeta is equal to 2.4. So 2.4 equal to that. We know omega, so we've got one unknown, which is zeta. Rearrange it for z to make z to the subject. 2.4 over 2 multiplied by 2, because we've just worked out um, natural frequency to be 2 raised in a second, and we can work out our damping ratio. So for this particular system, you can see here we've got um, the natural frequency to 2 raised a second, so it effectively lies on that line there, so you can see there that was 2, and also 0 0.6 here. So if we approximate this, oh, you can see there, that's the line of damping ratio we're there, so that means our pole must be there. And because the S-plane is symmetrical about the real axis, if we've got a pole there, it also means that it's going to be symmetrical down here. Um, so it's going to be on this line here, and 0 0.6, did I say? So it's going to be there. Okay, a pair of complex conjugate poles. So the mapping between the, the, the S-plane and the Z-plane, so the left half of the S-plane, effectively maps into something known as the unit circle. So it maps into this unit circle of, of the z-plane. So this is known as the z-plane, and this circle here, you can see, it's known as the unit circle. Um, and 
the z plane relates to the s plane given by this equation here. So z is equal to e of s, e to the power of s, where s is the pole, multi uh, multiplied by ts, where ts is the sample interval. So, <clears throat> in the case of obviously we, we identified our here our, our uh, line of natural frequency and line and damping, I'm just going to rub all this off. What happens is that mapping there, that exact mapping there, occurs in the in the, in the z plane. So you can see here the radius of the z plane is is one. Okay, it's symmetrical symmetrical about the real axis. You want your poles to be inside the unit circle. Outside the unit circle will give you an unstable system response. So lines of natural frequency, um, as I said, and the damping ratio map on exactly. Can you see here around about here? The damping ratios are so 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, etc., 0 0.1. On the unit circle, you'll have a value of 0, so you'll have an undamped system. And then your lines of natural frequency go about around uh, away like that. So you can see as you go around the circle, 0 0.1 multiplied by pi over t, where t is your sample interval, um, 0 0.3 uh, pi over t, where t is your sample interval, and you can see that effectively your location on the, the, the z plane in terms of your Pole location is a, is a function of the sample interval. So, as I said, we can work out the poles. We can locate the poles and zeros on the um, Z plane. So what I've got here is a continuous time transfer function, so the one we've just seen. I've discretized this with a sample interval of uh, one second. If you can't remember how to discretize that, look back at the discrete time system model, modeling video. And you can see here, discretize this at G of S to G of Z, and I've got this transfer function. Just note that um, typically we, we would work four to six decimal places as needed for the poles and zeros in the z-plane. It might actually be in fact that you need to go much higher decimal places, especially when you're doing simulation, um, that it might be that you need to kind of go um, much, much higher. But simulation enables you to take, obviously, as many decimal places as given. So what we can do to work out the poles, we've got here the quadratic formula, where obviously B, B, A and C are given by here, so A is 1. B is this value and C is this value. So we can just substitute those values into this quadratic formula and then we can work out the poles. So you can see here we've got a pair of complex conjugate poles and what I've done is um, got this pole zero map here and again um, one of the future videos you'll see one of the, in the series you'll see how, I, how we actually plot these pole zero maps and also the system response that you can see here. So you can see here the poles located here, pair of conjugate, complex conjugate poles and as I told you, the, net, the, the damping ratio was 0 0.6 and the natural frequency was 2 radians a second. So if you were to work out that 2, well, somewhere in between, but it's somewhere in between 2 point, 0 0.6 and 0 0.7, multiply by pi over t, where t is 1, you would get a value of 2. What we can also do is work out the 0, because what you'll notice is when you discretize this second order um, continuous time transfer function, you'll notice that you actually introduce a 0. Okay, and a zero is just a, when you introduce like effectively a root on the numerator. So if we just rearrange that, so because we want we want to make z the, the subject, so z is equal to then if we take away 0 0.3253 and then divide by 0 0.7830, you'll end up with this. Then simplify that and you'll end up with a zero at minus 0 0.4155. And hence you can see the zero there. And then you can see what I've done here is plot the graphical plot. And as you would expect, we've got some overshoot because you've got a pair of complex conjugate poles. So just remember, when we've got a zeta value of less than 1, we're going to get a system response that looks like this with some oscillation. Zeta equal to um, 1 is going to be critically damped. So a system with no fastest system response with no overshoot. Zeta greater than 1 will give you a overdamped system. So quite a sluggish response. So poles and zero mapping. So I'll be quick on this because I've spoken about this. But if your S plane, if your poles out to the right half of the, the S plane, it'll be outside the unit circle, as you can see here. Your pole, if you've got a pole located on the origin of the S plane, the pole will be located on the boundary of the unit circle. So it'll have a, effectively a value of 1. Um, so yeah, the, mod, um, the absolute value of that will be 1. Because if you look at the Z plane here, minus 1 and 1, as you'd expect, because the radius of this is 1. So minus 1 and 1. So it goes from minus 1 to 0 to 1, minus 1, 0 to 1. And um, 
yeah, complex poles in the S plane. So you see here we've got a complex pole. Maps on as, as you've just seen as a complex pole in the Z plane. Real pole in the S plane. Maps on as a real pole in the Z plane. Again, as you can see there. So in terms of location on the, the, the Z plane, so this is perhaps more useful in one of the future videos when you actually start looking at um, when you when you look at your pole location and you can change your transfer function, change properties. That's a useful investigation to do something like this, just to get a, a bit, a bit, bit more of an end understanding of the pole location in the Z plane. So because the pole location in the Z plane is going to dictate your system performance because your pole location comes with it a natural frequency and also a damping ratio. Okay, so if you wanted to work out natural frequency damping, we had a Z transform, you would convert back to, so in MATLAB you can use um, D to C, go back discrete to continuous, and then, then you can work out your natural frequency damping as, as I've just shown you. So as I said <clears throat> previously, well, briefly highlighted in it, but the relate this following relationship exists here. So <clears throat> as, um, let's first of all look at damping ratio, Increasing the damping ratio results in fewer oscillations. So as we go this way, we'd expect to get fewer oscillations as we increase the damping ratio, because it's effectively going to stiffen up the system. So as you can see here, this has got a lower value than this system here. And you can see here, you've got far fewer oscillations here, as you'd expect. Then this statement here, so increasing the natural frequency results in a faster system response time. So increasing it. So to, to increase it, obviously we're going to move this way around. So this one here, you can see, I don't know, it takes about eight seconds to get to um to get to to get to steady state. Um, then if we look at this one here, it's taken around four seconds. So again, as you'd expect. So as I told you, it, natural frequency and damping ratio are very important in terms of dictating the system performance. And you see here, pole outside the unit circle, and hence you're getting an unstable system response here. So a little bit in terms of um, some mathematics in terms of the poles, pole location in the in the Z plane. So if we consider the polar form, be aware of the following system properties. So you should be aware of this. So radius less than one gives you a decaying response. So a system where you, you effectively go into a steady state. R is equal to one gives you a sinusoidal response. So effectively an undamped system and R greater than 1 will give you an increasing response, i.e. an unstable system. So if we're considering the Cartesian complex form of the poles, so that's pretty much what we've, we've seen already, an alternative form um, <clears throat> is the polar form, where the Cartesian polar mapping is given by this. So you can see x and y, so x and y, and these are equal to R cos um, um, theta, Okay, so you can see that there, where R is just the radius, R sine theta. Again, so you can see right radius and angle. And you can work out the X and Y. The polar form is sometimes useful to um, look at in this form. So Z is equal to R, and then you've got your angle, plus or minus there here, theta. So where the polar coordinates are given by this. So you can effectively work out the radius. It's just using the Pythagoras theorem, so it's just going to be this x, x squared, plus y squared, square root of that, and that'll give you then your radius. And then if you want to work out the um, phi to the angle, it's just going to be the inverse tangent um, the, of the absolute value of um, y over x, so y over x, and that'll give you your angle. An alternative representation, um, well, not alternative, but a different kind of way of um, going about it. So if you wanted to work out the radius, and if you knew the natural frequency and damping ratio and TS, so the sampling interval that was used for that discrete time system, then you could work out the radius. And likewise, if you want to work out the angle and you knew the natural frequency, the sampling 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 um, interval and the damping ratio, you could work out the angle. So there's a few equations here that know we to kind of get a little bit more insight in terms of the pole mapping on the Z plane. So in terms of the system properties and response, so you have here your continuous time trans function. So we've got here three, well, we've got here the same continuous time trans function. The only variation is it's being, the sample interval is being changed. So we've gone from one, 0 0.5 and 0 0.05. 
just be aware that obviously your continuous time trans function the pole here is here here and here is always going to be the same it does not change when we discretize though with these different sampling tools what you'll notice here is the coefficients from these three different trans function has changed and then if we look on the mapping on the z plane you'll also be aware that your pole locations have changed you can see here the pole locations for these two poles pole locations for these two poles and then finally for these two poles the pole location has changed so you might be thinking well does that mean the system properties change the natural frequency the damping ratio um, I'm going to tell you no it does not the the same mathematical relationship between the and the physical properties between the continuous time and the discrete time trans function are still there and the way that uh, well effectively your pole location as I told you earlier is a function of the sample interval and I'll kind of get got a little illustrative example here just to kind of help you with that so if we consider um, on the Z plane because you know the natural frequency is equal to there's this some this leading coefficient 0 0.2 0 0.3 I'm just gonna call it a for now where I'm gonna say a is the identifier a multiplied by pi over TS so that TS I use TS but on MATLAB they use T it's just sampling interval same thing um, for example natural frequency is equal to 0 0.3 over pi uh, multiplied by pi over TS where a is 0 0.3 Okay, so 0 0.3 in this case, I'm just calling them the, the um, identifier. So then if we look back over here, so we know for this particular case, our, um, let's have a look, if we're going to say our natural frequency is 2 here. So natural frequency is 2, so 2 is here. So 2 is equal to A multiplied by pi over TS. Let's rearrange that now to make A the subject, because A is what we're interested in, because what we're saying is effectively our pole locations are changing. And effectively, the line of natural frequency, the, what we what we are, um, what we well, the line of natural frequency um, that we're associated to is changing. The value of natural frequency is not changing, but the line that we we are linked to is changing. Okay, and the lead coefficient here is effectively the thing that's changing. So let's make a the subject. So a is equal to t two, which is our natural frequency. This multiplied by t s over pi. Where in this case the natural free uh, sorry the sample interval we've given a value of one. So then if we just work that out, you get a value of 0 0.6366. So we're looking at this particular pole. You would notice it's not very it's not that easy to see, but you would notice that this pole goes to around there. So you can see around six zero point six around there. Now if we um, again use the same equation, but we're gonna now substitute in sample interval 0 0.5. What you'll notice is now I've worked that out, the value here has changed. Okay, and you'll notice now that if I then go across here, let me just rub that out, and go across here, it's around 0 0.3. And then finally, if I substitute in a value of 0 0.05, what you'll notice here is the pole here has gone to around there. So it's around a value now of 0 0.03. So as I told you, the pole location on the z-plane is a function of the sample interval the physical properties don't change because as you can see I've kept the natural frequency the same all the way through on these calculations the thing that's changed is the it's TS and hence that you change in terms of the line that you're associated with because you can see the equation is a function of TS so finally what I've got here is an example where I've got the water tank level control system that we've been using closed loop control system trans function that we've been using throughout where you can see here and here well you can see here is the, just the general form for the closed loop and then you can see here the equation for the closed loop where I've substituted the values and for this particular value here and here we've got a proportional control gain of 5 and then it simplifies to give me something that looks like that then what I've done then is substituted in this case a value 5 I've got this then I've used MATLAB C to D to then dis discretize the the closed loop control system to give me this discrete time trans function here for the closed loop system. I've then worked out the pole. So in this case, the pole is in this particular example is 0 0.799. And you can see the mapping on here. So you can see pole location, damping, overshoot, frequency, etc. Then what I've done, rather than having a value of 5 in here, I've then substituted in a value of 10, 10 here. I've then obviously that now doesn't I've then obviously simplified this I've used C to D in MATLAB so continuous to discrete 
and then it's given me this discrete transfer function here. And I've done that one last time, so I've done that for 10, I've then done it for 15, so I've done this and this for value 15. I've then discretized using MATLAB, and then this here is the transfer function that I get. And what you'll notice is the pole location is changing. And the pole location is moving this way. You can see it's moved ever so slightly this way, and it's moved ever so slightly this way. And what you'll notice is the frequency is range of seconds, which is your natural frequency. The natural frequency of the system is increasing. So what I told you was as, as you if you increase the natural frequency of the system, you're going to get a faster system response. This is effectively what you can see on this graphical output here. And you have seen this graphical output here when we looked at the final value theorem. So we have got KP is equal to 5, 10 and 15. So increase the portion control gain, reduce the steady state error. And what you'll notice is that the system response is a bit faster. So it's it, it's kind of, you can see it's responding much, much quicker. And that's what you would expect as you increase the natural frequency. So the proportional control gain, increasing the proportional control gain is, is, is giving you a faster system response because it's increasing the natural frequency and it's reducing the steady state error. So in summary, I've detailed the Z, the details of the Z plane have been given. So the lines are natural frequency, the lines are damping, the fact that it's got a radius of one. Um, the poles need to be located within the unit circle. Um, on, the board, on, on the outside of the unit circle, you'd have an unstable system. And I've also detailed the effect of the proportional control gain um, just then to show that effectively the proportional control gain is changing the pole location and it's hence changing the system response. And then the next steps, what we're going to look at is the stability of the closed loop control system with proportional control gain. And what we'll look at using is the jury test effectively to identify whether a system is stable and then to use a jury test to determine the range of the KP for which will give me a stable system. So thanks for listening. If you've got any questions, please email me.